Something unusual is happening inside the United States. More American citizens are now permanently leaving. And according to a new groundbreaking study, more than half of Gen Z want to move out of the United States for this sad reason. But why are Americans leaving the U.S.? Isn't the United States the land of freedom and opportunity? Why is it that even CNN is reporting the American dream is to leave America? According to a recent survey of 3,000 Gen Z U.S. citizens, 25.6% want to live abroad for better health care. 18.9% wanted new cultural experiences, 18% wanted a lower cost of living, and 17.7% wanted to leave because of American politics. In today's episode, I'm bringing in a very special guest to discuss this trend and what it means to leave the United States and live abroad permanently. My guest is Mr. Andrew Henderson. He is the CEO of Nomad Capitalist, the world's number one resource for global citizens, helping people around the world gain access to second passports, reducing their tax liabilities, and learning to safeguard their assets. The Nomad Capitalist YouTube channel has over 780,000 subscribers and is filled with an incredible library of videos that are an amazing asset to every investor in the world. What's most interesting about Andrew Henderson is that he renounced his U.S. citizenship, acquired multiple new passports, and lives in multiple locations around the globe. When I asked him why he gave up his U.S. citizenship, he had this amazing insight. Do I want to be in a country that's more neutral and just gets along with everybody, gets along with Europe, right. gets along with China, just minds their own business? Or do I want to have the scarlet letter that I'm from a country that goes around pissing everyone off in a world where emerging markets are increasingly gaining prominence, including in my business, where we have more and more clients that hire us from emerging markets all around the world. Why would I make it harder for myself to do business? It's a powerful and true statement. Emerging markets around the world most definitely are the future. And I'm also excited to announce that I'll be joining Mr. Henderson on stage in Malaysia this fall, as I attend the Nomad Capitalist live event taking place in Kuala Lumpur this September 25th through the 28th. I look forward to sharing the stage with Mr. Henderson and meeting an incredible group of speakers and guests from around the world. But first, enjoy this exclusive interview with Mr. Andrew Henderson. But I want to talk about you. You know, like looking back, what are the key factors that influence your decision to leave the United States and pursue a life abroad? I left the United States and then I went on years later to actually give up U.S. citizenship because U.S. citizens have uh, a lot of requirements. It's not just taxes. There's a lot of requirements that, that come with being a U.S. citizen that Canadians, for example, don't have. And I think the reason anyone leaves their country is they think that there's something better somewhere else. And to some extent, the grass is always greener, they say. But I think that for me, uh, I found better social opportunities. I thought that you know the world was shifting. If you look at just a graph of where wealth is in the world, I mean, it was moving very much westward for quite a number of years. And now it's moving back to the east for the first time uh, in a long time. And I wanted to be a part of that. I wanted to see those opportunities. And I thought along the way, okay, well, how does that affect my taxes? Because I was running, you know, some businesses that were done on the phone, basically. They were done on, a, right. on an internet phone. And I said, okay, well, there's internet everywhere. In fact, I just talked to a friend of mine in New York the other day. I mean, his internet was a lot slower and more uh, splotchy than mine was in, let's say, Malaysia, where I live. And so I just said, okay, this is just the, the quality of life. The cost of living, that's not as much of a factor for me any, anymore, but you know, way back in the day, that was something you can, you can make your dollars go a lot further. The cost of living, the quality of life is better in other countries. You know, politically speaking, people are on each other's throats. And I'll tell you this, I'll tell you what I think people, you know, that's happened since I left many years ago. I woke up this morning and one of the people on my team who lives in Georgia said that the Georgian, Georgian citizens now can go visa-free to China. It's a country I know you're familiar with. You know, so you see a lot of the countries in the Western Balkans that have gotten visa-free access to Russia and China. Armenians a couple of years ago had got access. Now Georgians have access. They got access to Russia as well. Like Georgian passport, uh, some of the Balkan passports, they've got substantially better. There's not nearly as much of a delta between, let's say, a U.S. passport and some of these kind of emerging world passports the way there once was. But right. I look at the same headlines. Oh, well, you know, Trump, you could like Trump, you could not like Trump, but Trump wants to have certain policies with China and what have you. And I say to myself, if that happens and I'm an entrepreneur and I'm selling products globally or I source my products in China, I have a factory or whatever, do I want to be in a country that's more neutral and just gets along with everybody, gets along with Europe, gets along with China, just minds their own business? Or do I want to have the scarlet letter that I'm from a country that goes around pissing everyone off in a world where emerging markets are increasingly gaining prominence, including in my business, where we have more and more clients that hire us 
from emerging markets all around the world. Why would I make it harder for myself to do business? Right. Yeah, no, that's a good, that's a very good uh, response there. And I think that's, that's really the sentiment I think of a lot of Americans once they, once they actually do go abroad, of course, you know, you and I would be very much the minority of Americans that have lived abroad for a long number of time. And I think there's a bubble that exists in America, right? I mean, when, you know, for most people, they, you know, most Americans don't have passports. Most Americans never leave the, this country. So it's, it's, it's difficult for them to understand what's going on outside that world. But I think once you do get outside, you can really look at the United States in a very different way. You can kind of see how the world looks at America. And it's not always as bright and rosy as we Americans probably think. I mean, don't get me wrong. I think you and I, we probably, we, you know, we both love our country, both love the United States. There's certainly some good aspects about that. Um, but I think oh. our foreign policy decisions around the world, and that kind of yeah. goes into my realm of geopolitics, I think has really uh, complicated things a lot. And we're seeing that, you know, with all of these conflicts and wars that we are getting involved in that seem, seem endless, you know, and, and really there is no pathway to ending these wars anytime soon. I mean, I'm sure a year from now, two years from now, we'll still be in, very much involved in this. Um, let's kind of continue this thread, though. Um, you know, for Americans that might be contemplating a move abroad, um, which countries or regions do you like as far as lifestyle, investment opportunities? And and like you said, you're an entrepreneur, yeah. so it's kind of the ease of doing business. Well, let me just piggyback on your last comment real quick. I think we saw during the pandemic, we saw Americans starting to get passports. You saw people wanting to travel. You saw people wanting to get out. But I think that there's still a bubble of people really think, oh, well, but okay, like we'll travel and we'll go somewhere temporarily, but this is still the best place. So good for people for traveling. But yeah. the story I've been telling is I met one of my bankers in a private bank based in Singapore, come to a dinner where I live in Kuala Lumpur. I lived there part of the year. And I asked, I said, confirm my suspicion. You'd rather have a wealthy Vietnamese or Indonesian client than a wealthy American or German client. She said, absolutely. There's far less regulatory burden. We understand them more. Uh, we could care less where your money comes from. And we have clients from some of those emerging Asian countries, emerging Latin American countries, they have $100 million. They have $200 million. Why does a bank in Singapore care who's $100 million? I think some of these Americans think that their $10 million is more attractive to these banks and investment funds right. than some Vietnamese guy's $100 million. Nobody cares anymore. Your $10 million right. comes with way too many requirements, and strings, and regulations. They've got to check everything. It's not nearly as profitable. Like, there's not this insane demand around the world. Now, there's plenty of banks who will take Americans. To answer your question, I mean, one of the things you can do to set up more opportunities to bank around the world and to move your assets, and, and by banking, oftentimes invest in those local markets, uh, is to have residence permits. I think the yeah. best value place in the world is Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. I've lived there for a long time. We're hosting Nomad Calculus Live there. Now, I'm not saying it's the absolute best, but you've right. got some of the best healthcare in the world, almost on par with Singapore. That Nice. Insane. I mean, we put out videos of this insanely low prices. You know how cheap it is. Great care. Yeah. People trained in the UK. It's great. Great food. Super nice people. Nice weather. Very tax friendly. Yeah. And so for me, I mean, insanely cheap in a world of inflation because their currency is weaker. It's a 26 year low. You get a lot of bang for your buck. And so I enjoy spending the winters there. And that's why for having a large event where, you know, I could have the event in Dublin, Ireland or in right. Dubai, but you'd pay a lot, lot more. You wouldn't get more as a guest. Right. Of it. So I think Kuala Lumpur is, is, the, is the gem of Asia. I think that Americans who, who, who maybe are willing to have a little bit of a language barrier, but they want a similar culture, Mexico, a lot of people have gone to Mexico. I've been talking about that for eight or nine years. People are now catching up with that. Very similar culture. Uh, a lot of people go within Latin America, but the time zone, I have a home in Colombia. That's not a place to live full time because of the tax. Um, Uruguay is interesting, I think. People who want a plan B far away from it all, similar time zone. Obviously, with the new president in Argentina, that's an affordable place to go. Doug Casey, who was a mentor of mine, I mean, he, he talked for years about being the kind of the ignored foreigner. They don't, they don't bother down in Argentina. Right. So I think Southern South America is interesting. Um, we've right. talked about places in Eastern Europe. People are more brusque. But if you just want to kind of be left alone, you know, there's a culture of that. So I think nice. those are some places to look. I mean, there's opportunities everywhere, quite frankly. I, I have homes in seven places, but I think those are some that stand out for the average person. That's the thought process. Yeah, that's good. Well, I'm really looking forward to going to Kuala Lumpur uh, because it is actually one of my favorite cities in Asia. I've traveled there frequently and I agree with you. It's also, it's a great melting pot because there's so many different cultures yeah. and, uh, you know, you've got Indians there, Malays, you've got Chinese. So I, I almost said, you know, you can kind of experience all of Asia in one city. It really is uh, a great representation.
implementation and I agree and, with you and all here's the here's we have to get into this one point here's yeah. one can, misconception that americans still have they say it about istanbul where i stop in occasionally they say it right. about kuala lumpur oh it's a muslim country what you don't understand okay listen maybe in saudi arabia well we had a guy who spoke last year zubi spoke he grew up in yeah. saudi arabia before any of the recent reforms he said it's not what you think it is that's his opinion right but maybe that place is a bit more strict kuala lumpur zero people care what you do if you're not malay muslim zero they don't care what you right. wear they don't care who you love they don't care they will literally tell you to your face we have a standard for ourselves as practicing muslims what you do is your relationship with whatever god you want to have in your life i think it's a great misunderstanding and you'll see to your point you'll see people who are malaysian chinese malaysian indian who are expats from all over the world they don't dress to the muslim standard they drink alcohol nobody cares right yeah i found the same way i actually went to turkey in uh, november for the first time and i've had a very similar experience you know it's uh, certainly a muslim country and uh, you know a lot of americans actually when i told my friends i was going there they were like wow are you going to be safe over there and and you couldn't it was fantastic i had a wonderful visit uh, it was a great experience in turkey and i mean even for most turks that they um, you know they're very open very very progressive and it's been it's fantastic fantastic city fantastic country and, and the places um, where you're going to go by the way i'm sorry to get the places that you're yeah. going to go are are going to match I have a friend, he, he, he grew up in, uh, in the deep south in the US, he's gay. He feels yeah. much more comfortable in Eastern Europe and in Istanbul than he does where he grew up. Now, yeah. maybe he would feel a little more comfortable in New York than in Istanbul, but in my neighborhood in Istanbul, I mean, it's pretty much the same as New York. So, yeah. you, know, I, I, you know, I mean, listen, there's people who live in Boston who are paying a lot of money in taxes. They would be better off moving to Ireland, being non-doms for tax purposes, lowering their tax bill to you know ten percent on the U.S. side, and right. they probably have a similar culture rather than moving to Dallas, Texas, right? right. But we we don't make that correlation. That's true. That's true. Now we've talked a lot about you know, for example, going abroad, and I think that is um, you know we're we're certainly willing to do that, and we've done that for many years. Um, what about people that are you know wanting to have something while still residing? in the US. Is there any alternatives to that? So there's plan A and there's plan B. I wanted to live outside of the US because I wanted to see my first stops were in Asia. And I, I still have yeah. a home in Kuala Lumpur. Uh, I thought Asia was the place that was up and coming, wanted to see it. I was a young single guy. I'm a bit more sedentary now, a little bit more sedentary. And so that's what motivated me. If you just want to invest, number one, you can have things like bank accounts and investment accounts overseas. Uh, I've done very well recently investing in Indonesia, for example. I looked at the Indonesia ETF in the US. It's underperforming what I have through a lo local Asian brokerage because they're much more on the ground and they cer pick certain stocks rather than just mirroring an index. So what you see investing in like an ETF in the US is maybe not going to perform as well as something you get locally that's managed locally with more local experience. So you can do that. You can take part in these emerging world investments. You know, I, I like Indonesia. I have a lot of exposure to Cambodian real estate. Uh, I have investments all over the place. Um, Bank of Georgia stock. It's an interesting bank to bank with. Uh, the stock has done very well for me in the last um, year or so. So you can do those things. Um, even if you're an American, there are banks and brokerages that will take you. Um, you can also work on setting up residence permits. So a place like a Mexico, for example, uh, you're not required to live there to maintain your residence permit. A lot of the residence uh, programs in Latin America have that requirement. You don't really have to be there. Maybe you go one day a year. So it's there if you need it. During the pandemic, I was able to go to Colombia and jump to the front of the line as a permanent resident of Colombia. Uh, right. I didn't have to be there more than one day every two years, but I was able to go there and, and I was able to get in when no one else could. So that was kind of a backup plan for me. You can get second passports through your family tree. So if you have ancestors, grandparents, great grandparents, you can go back a certain number of generations, uh, whether it's in Europe or the Caribbean or Latin America, get a passport that way. There's citizenship by investment programs. You buy real estate in Turkey. You make a donation to a Caribbean island. There's others. Um, you can get European Union citizenship even in Malta by making a much larger donation, close to a million dollars. We help people do all those different programs. So like, I would look at asset diversification, maybe some kind of foreign trust that doesn't reduce your taxes, but it protects your assets, your foreign assets having some kind of residence and citizenship program, and then you can turn that stuff on. My only caveat is people say, oh, well, if you did all this stuff, and then to your point, you were in Ukraine when all hell broke loose, what do you do? Well, you're not supposed to use that as an excuse to sit around until the last minute. Better years too early than a day too late. And so why we have Nomad Capitalist Live and 
Kuala Lumpur is partially because I have a lot of foreign staff that couldn't go to Las Vegas. They, they don't have U.S. visas. They wouldn't get U.S. visas. Mm -hmm. But for me, a bunch of other guys have events in Las Vegas or in Austin. What do you learn about going offshore by going to Austin? Mm -hmm. I want people to come and see it because if you saw, my father came and said, Kuala Lumpur is probably better than most U.S. cities. Mm -hmm. He said, if people came and saw this, they might be willing to move sooner. Right. They might be willing to turn the plan B into a plan A sooner and not hang on until that very last second where Robert Kiyosaki told us at our 2021 event, he said, where could you be in three days? Well, we've seen in the last couple of years, that's a good idea. Be ready. Yeah. But even you may not even have three days to get ready. I mean, I, I remember I got back to Malaysia from Myanmar. 24 hours before they closed the border. And we were open in Malaysia before Florida was open. I think yeah. it did close back down again later. But, you know, you didn't have three days. So, like, turn your plan B into a plan A sooner, is my opinion. And if I can show people places that are perhaps just as good as where they're living, they would do that at least part time. So, I yeah. have family that live in Mexico, half time. Hey, if things get worse in the US, we just won't take that one flight a year back. We'll just stay here because we can't. Right. We're not tourists, we're residents. Yeah, yeah, that's a good, that's very good. Um, I want to go more towards the business side because I'd be a very successful entrepreneur. You have an amazing company, a best-selling author, all of these uh, accolades. Um, how has your approach to entrepreneurship really evolved through your experiences and all of these different cultures and business environments? I think that living overseas, and particularly what I do, I, I created what I call the trifecta approach because I just genuinely couldn't decide where I want to live. I like a little bit of Latin America. I like a good chunk of Asia. I have liked yeah. Eastern Europe. Um, now, as I'm getting a little bit older, I'm spending all these years in kind of crazy places. I like incorporating one of a handful of Western countries into the mix um, to speak English and have the consumer you know, stuff, but it creates friction. So particularly when you're in many different cultures, it creates friction. And I think if you go into it, I mean, I've got friends who follow my lead and they hired a bunch of people in some of the countries we've hired and I'm seeing some of the stuff and I'm telling them like, hey, just be attent be aware of the friction that comes up. People do things differently. And so you'll learn a lot more about yourself and you'll become a lot more self-aware by being, you know, when you live in the United States, everyone's like you or wherever you're from, everyone's like you and you may not notice some of those differences quite as much. But when you go to Eastern Europe, when you go to Asia, I mean, it hits you. I mean, when I first right. started talking to people many, many years ago about hiring in the Philippines, for example, they're like, the, the culture in parts of Southeast Asia is very much, it's hierarchical. Here's a process, execute the process, and there's a level of management that's expected, which is different yeah. from what you might expect in, in U.S. cultures. One of the best books I've ever read, which has really had an influence on me, it's called The Culture Map by Erin Meyer. And she talks about all the different cultures and how to deal with it and how to uh, criticize. I met an executive from, uh, from Meta here recently, and he talked about, you know, telling the Singaporeans not to work so late. But he did so yeah. to them as a group. And it's like, you right. can't do that. They're going to they're gonna shut down. Like they, they want you individually. You talk to them individually. Whereas like a German person, that, you know, you kind of beat up on them during the meeting and uh, in front of everybody else. And then you go out and have beers afterwards. And so if you understand those cultural differences in, in it, you know, you don't look at them as better or worse. Uh, it's going to create a friction that causes you to drive much more self-awareness and understand where you're really at. I think that you know, self-awareness is something that I didn't realize until I spent many years working on it, how little of it many people have. You're going right. to be way far ahead of people. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And you have to approach things with a very open mind as well and just be very willing to understand that there's different, um, you know, every every society, every culture is different, you know, it needs some time to adjust and approach things with an open mind. I know when I first moved to China, that was probably my biggest strength was just being very open minded and understanding the way that, hey, this is this is China. It's different, very much different than the United States. And I kind of noticed that any expat that really struggled there, you know, they kept looking at it through the eyes of a Western lens. You know, it's like, well, in America, right. we do it this way. So why aren't we following this protocol? Like, and why well, is that the baseline? Here. Yeah, exactly. Why am I like, well, we're not in America, you know, so you have to shift it and you have to change your perspective. Let's look at it from the Chinese perspective where they might say, hey, actually, there's a reason why we do this. And, you know, it's and again, it's just a cultural difference. So I'm always trying to, you know, take off the American lenses and say, let me put myself in the spot of this Chinese person. Look at it from their perspective. When you do that, oftentimes you're able to really connect the dots and say, OK, now I understand why they're doing this way. I understand this is part of the culture. And now I can really understand that and when you really start to approach things in that way, I think you're really going to start to integrate better and, you know, have have a successful time abroad as an expat and, you know, definitely be a lot easier life for you. And that's when you'll be a more successful investor as well, I think. I mean, I've got a friend yeah. that, that does a lot of business in places like Cambodia and Thailand. He'll go in and he'll say, hey, listen, I'm going to buy your apartment building. I'm going to offer you 30 cents in the dollar. Yeah. And 
he'll end up buying it for 40 cents or 50 cents in the dollar. Whereas, I mean, you probably see this in China, people go to the, you know, foreigners go to the Silk Street market or wherever in Beijing and, yeah. you know, the, they sell in some knockoff scarf for 500 RMB and they'll offer 450. Like that's a savvy negotiation. You have to offer 30, exactly. 90, 94% off and then settle for like 90% off. Exactly. Um, and that exactly. applies to things like real estate. And I've seen that people come like, I don't want to talk to your real estate guy, Andrew. Like, oh, I'll, I'll go and find some, I saw some billboard or something. And then like, they're always overpaying by 20 or 30% because they're yeah. thinking like, hey, in Ohio, we offer, you know, 6% off and that's kind of smart. I don't know. Yeah, totally, totally. And you only get that from being there and really understanding that culture. So, so that's good, Andrew. Uh, question, because you brought up some really interesting countries and places in the world. I mean, you're talking about your investments in uh, Cambodia real estate. You talked about owning the stock of the Bank of Georgia. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of things that I think a lot of people probably are not tuned into and not really uh, aware of from an investing part. So what about some kind of lesser known emerging markets that you really think is a hidden gem for investments? If you can get, kind of share some of your tidbits there. I mean, you already have so far, but just wanted to give you another opportunity if there's any more kind of these hidden yeah. gems. I think Latin America is an interesting lifestyle destination. So, I mean, to answer your earlier point on why I'm in Kuala Lumpur, I think the pe people don't understand is I decompartmentalize everything. So I've talked about what I call the global citizen sandwich. In Kuala Lumpur, you're right next door to Singapore. Singapore is mm -hmm. obviously an asset hub, very cost efficient ways to invest. I think it's the best pound for pound transactional banking market in the world, below Switzerland away, in my opinion. I have enough money to open some of the best, you know, Swiss bank accounts. And I just told my CFO yesterday, like, why do we want to put $5 million in this bank where they treat us badly? Um, yeah. Let's like, just go to Singapore and have, you know, do treasury management there. So I think Singapore's good, but do I want to live in Singapore and and pay a 60% stamp duty on property when I move there right. because I'm not a local and they don't want non-locals buying property and raising prices. Like, no, it's not worth it. Like live in Kuala Lumpur, one of the cheapest housing markets in the world for high quality stuff in great locations. And then I can go downstream and invest in Cambodia. I'm starting to look at Nepal. I'm, I'm looking with some friends in Bangladesh. I think those are affordable nice. places. So like, I'm going to live in kind of that middle and I'm gonna go up for asset placement and I'm gonna go down for kind of exotic emerging market opportunities. Um, I think Egypt is interesting. It's less successful. I think it's very interesting. You know, Latin America, I was mentioning in the beginning was, I think it's more of a lifestyle destination. I, I don't really know anywhere. I guess Uruguay could work. Um, yeah. You can open some Uruguay bank accounts, but outside of Uruguay, I don't know any good places in Latin America to put substantial sums of money. There's a place right. called Miami. That's where they all go. They all go to Miami. Right. I, like, right. I, I don't want to put my money in Miami. So Latin America to me, I mean, I've done well on some Brazilian stocks. I think that's more tenuous. So I think Georgia, Armenia, like I've done very well on Armenian bonds. I mean, interest rates in those two countries are very high. You just have term deposit, they'll pay you 11%. And so I was able to buy George Lari and Armenian Dram before COVID and before the war. And so, you know, I've gotten 20 and 30% appreciation, making 11% a year on just a bank deposit. Um, right. During the war, you know, something like the Bank of Georgia has done very well because they have all these inflows as, as Russians move there. Um, so that's been interesting. Is that going to be interesting long term? Well, I mean, years ago, I said buy real estate in Georgia. I think that's probably played out for now. I said buy yeah. real estate in Istanbul. Same thing with the war. I think it's probably a little bit played out now. So, there's always some place that's next. And I think what the problem that people do, um, by the way, I'm happy to make investments to get a residence or a citizenship. I mean, if you buy half a million euros of various investment funds in Portugal, they'll give you a golden visa. You can work towards citizenship. It's a European Union country. You don't have to live there more than seven days a year. Like that's something people should be doing for their children. And we help people do that. But I mean, the challenge is people want to invest in Singapore or South Korea once it's Singapore or South Korea. Uh, when Singapore was like a backwater hellhole 50 years ago, people were laughing at the same way that they, they probably are laughing when I say Bangladesh now. You're not right. going to win everything. I mean, Warren Buffett said he made, what, a dozen good decisions in his entire career. They were just really good decisions. Yeah. So, you know, I'm, I'm looking for in a pie where so many more countries are competing for, the t for, for something, you're probably not going to have one Singapore. What you're going to have is, people, is countries that take their own share of the pie, and that's going to be very valuable. But you have to be interested when no one else is interested. Uh, I think that China right now, quite frankly, has been beaten down. I've done very well in the last year or so with Chinese bank stocks, incredibly high tax-free dividends. Um, you've yep. seen some appreciation. I think China is very beaten down. Uh, you know, I want to own stuff that everyone else laughs at you for owning. I mean, like wanting to buy NVIDIA, I'm sure there's still, maybe there's still some more, I, I'm not an investment advisor, but I, I, 
I guess there's still more room to run in some of those AI stocks, but like I want to buy stuff that nobody uh, wants to buy. I mean, China's down 60% in some cases. I mean, like yeah. the company that sells electricity to people, like really? I mean, it's trading at book yeah. value. I mean, you can't. Come on. Yeah, absolutely. Well, there's some definitely some uh, opportunities there. And uh, same Warren Buffett strategy, right? When others are uh, greedy, you should be fearful. And when others are fearful, you should be greedy, right? That's a, a, always a classic Buffett uh, quote. So Japan yeah. was beaten down. And Japan's been a great number. I've had a couple of Japanese stocks double in the last year. Do I think that it has yeah. more room to roll? I don't know. It's a 34 year high. I, I don't know. I paired back some of my Japanese holdings, but that was one that was left for dead. Yeah. And I think it's interesting. I mean, you look at a company like Alibaba as well. I mean, it's a huge presence in China. I mean, it's basically back at IPO level. So, I mean, you can get that stock and I mean, it's not like it's going anywhere, right? Alibaba is going to be a massive company for the future and continue. So there's always, uh, always opportunities out there. And I, I agree with you. You know, you need to look where others aren't, um, aren't looking, right? NVIDIA. I mean, there's a cultural thing. Chinese yeah. people historically, you know, buy real estate, yes. like something like it's a single digit percentage of the Chinese population buy shares. There's a lot of institutional interest. You're right. seeing some uptick now in people buying shares because they are feeling burned by real estate with everything that's going on right now. So, I mean, I think that, you know, some of these things are cultural and if you can figure out how to play that to your advantage, I mean, again, you can't just go and assume this is the United States. That's right. That's right. How about let's go, let's shift our, our conversation to taxes. And what is kind of the biggest myth about tax optimization for, you know, nomads that you'd like to debunk? So if you're an American, and I'll get to non-Americans in a minute, but if you're an American and you've heard about what's called citizenship-based taxation, you might think, well, I have to pay taxes as an American no matter where I live. I might live in, as well live in the United States. And so you see people moving from like California to Texas. That doesn't really right. solve your overall tax puzzle. I mean, you went from, I lived in Arizona, all in, I was paying 43% at one point. Let's say you're right. paying 48 in California and 39 in Texas if you're a high earner. I mean, right. 39 still a lot. Right. Um, and so if you you can either move to Puerto Rico, which you know there's there's entrepreneurs and there's investors and there's different tax treatment in different places for Americans, right. depending on which one you are, but you can move to Puerto Rico or you can move overseas and you can move overseas to one place. Or you can move overseas to any number of places if you spend more time out of the country. I didn't want to live in the US, so I did the latter. I was just right. gone the entire time. And so I was able to reduce my taxes to zero. I probably could have kept it at zero myself. They made some changes to where now the average person is probably going to pay somewhere in the single digits, maybe 10%. But if you can go from paying, you know, 37% of the top federal bracket, plus whatever the state is, if you have it, plus social security up to the cap, plus Medicare with no cap, plus whatever new, I mean, I keep hearing about a wealth tax. I keep trying to bring that in. You know, I mean, going even to 10 is not a bad deal. So I think you can legally reduce your taxes as an American. And for some Americans, you can pay zero. I think I would have kept paying zero. I just decided it was, it's too much paperwork. Um, I didn't right. value US citizenship otherwise. It's not like, oh, what? I mean, like if it was like, hey, pay a little taxes and keep this citizenship you love, anyone, I mean, you might think it's unfair, but you would do it. I didn't want this citizenship, and I think the reasons since I was a kid were more geopolitical. If you're not an American, I think the biggest thing is people have this idea of 183 days in their mind because there's that's what's called a days test. So Western countries now have multiple tests. And if you're if you're in Canada, the UK, Germany, Australia, what have you, numerous tests that you need to to pass if you want to leave the country's tax system. So if you live in Australia, you're taxed on everything in the world. So your 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 Hong Kong stocks, which pay tax free dividends in Hong Kong, Australia says, well, you live here, so pay us the tax. Right. You can, but you can leave Australia. Unlike Americans who, until you give up the citizenship, still have that burden following you, even if you can exempt most of it. Australians, everybody else can leave. And so they think, well, I just won't spend 183 days in my country. Well, that's one of two, three, four, five tests, some of which are right. much more subjective in most Western countries. If I live in Colombia and I have a home in Colombia, I'm a permanent resident in Colombia, their test is pretty simple. It is a strict days test. So if I spend 182 days in Colombia, I'm not that stupid to have a house there. You have to pay tax, they have high taxes. I'm not a tax resident of Colombia. I'm an immigration right. resident, but I don't spend enough time there and in that part right. of the world to be taxed. So a country like a Colombia has a more simple tax system. 
Whereas a country like an Australia or a Germany, they've got much more subjective tests. And people have got this idea in their mind, as long as I'm not there for six months, they can thread the needle the same way that you would in Colombia, and you can get away with that. And that's not really the case. And I came out last right. summer, and some people agreed, and, and some people who don't know what they're talking about disagreed. And, they said, and I said, Australia is moving closer to kind of a de facto citizenship taxation because they're trying to make it yeah. so hard that if you're a citizen born in the country and you've lived there your entire life, which most citizens have, right. um, they're making it much harder harder for you to leave the tax net. They're really making you prove like you, you've gone. You've got to really cut your ties more than you had to in the past. Yeah. And so it's not just about days. I think if you're going to leave a Western country, you should be prepared to not spend that much time there and at least commit to spending you know five years outside of the country if you want to save taxes. The good thing is if you're not an American, you can choose your tax rate anywhere you want. And it's only between right. you and the place that you move. But the idea that you're going to spend half your time in Australia or Canada or Germany and then half your time puttering around the world as a nomad, that's not really going to be as tax advantageous as you think. You need to figure out probably, not giving tax advice here, but less time where you're from, some time at a fixed base, and then maybe if you want to travel, you can. Yeah, yeah, that's fair. That's good advice. Another question. What about, um, what do you think is going to be the this most significant change that you're going to see for this this rise in, you know, uh, nomad capitalists, you know, people that want to have this kind of lifestyle and they want to go abroad, they want to, you know, go travel the world, things like that. Uh, what do you think is going to be the biggest change in the next decade? Do you, you just, is the biggest change going to be a, just a massive increase of more people doing this? What, what do you see here? Well, it is. I think that the change is going to be, it's, it's number one, it's going more mainstream. Yeah. And number two, as it goes mainstream, you're getting very successful people to want to get into it. I mean, we've had multiple billionaires who are our clients. And I'll tell you what one of them told me. He said, you know, I've hired all the fancy firms out there. When you have someone who's a multi-billionaire, I mean, they're never just like hiring one company. They're hiring multiple companies. But they said, you know, I think you know the stuff that people, other people don't know. And so if you watch me on YouTube, you're like, how can this guy be talking to rich people? He talks about Mexico. Right. I said, because I fundamentally think that if I were to give birth today and I did choose for the, my wife to give birth either on American soil, and I'm no longer an American, and she's not American, or on Mexican soil, 18 years from now and thereafter, which would I rather have? All things, in, all things considered, right? Obviously, you know, I'm not going to give my child all my wealth, but they won't be, you know, fending for scraps. I'd rather have a Mexican child. I'd rather them be a Mexican citizen. I think that, I mean, I was on CBS News. I was talking about the peso's appreciation against the dollar. I own Mexican bank stocks for the yield. And so I think it's a good play for the peso. Market country's done very well in some sectors in recent years. I just think it's the country that has a brighter future. And so yeah. I think that, you know, you can be a wealthy person and want to have a toehold in a country like Mexico. By the way, you've been to Mexico City. There's stunningly beautiful neighborhoods there for very yeah. wealthy people. We've had clients from Mexico, they drive Ferraris, you know. So I, I think that for what I talk about, which is have multiple residences, have multiple passports. Listen, get a Portugal passport through the golden visa or track down those Italian ancestors or Irish ancestors or donate a million dollars and become Maltese and have that top quality US Western passport equivalent. It's just as good as what you have now or better. Fine. Right. That's part of the strategy. That, that works. Or move to Ireland or somewhere and you already speak the language, wait five years and get it. And you can do those things very tax friendly. But you know what? I mean, I have some weird passports in there. I don't talk about all of them. I have islands. I have interesting countries. I have countries that are friendly with the West, but also with the East. I, I think you want to mix because you don't know which nice. direction the world's going geopolitically. Right. I'm happy not to have a passport where they're going around bombing people, where they're going around starting trade wars with people. You can say whatever you want about America first. Guess what? Other countries are starting to put them themselves first. And you think you know Absolutely. probably as well as anybody, sanctions by the US are up fourfold since Y2K. There right. aren't four times more bad guys. There's right. four times more places that the US uses threats that are increasingly saying, that's great, we'll just sell to the Indians. We don't need you that much anymore. And we'll yeah. still become wealthier. We won't be US wealthy, but we'll be still wealthier than we were 25 years ago. Right. And those are the places you can invest. I mean, don't invest in sanctioned places if you're not if you're an American. That's obviously something to be careful about. But for me, yeah. I think that you're gonna see some very wealthy people get involved. And sure, we have lots of wealthy clients who just want to get the Malta passport that gives them access to live anywhere in Europe what, 27, actually 30 countries to choose from. They also want the agricultural land in Colombia. Right, 
Yeah. No, that's a fantastic. I mean, it's such an interesting conversation today because I think you've opened up, uh, you know, certainly my eyes even more. I have three passports myself, but I mean, I'm always interested in this global economy. And I think it's, uh, I think it's very fascinating just how our world is uh, evolving so much. And certainly that is my expertise of covering it from the geopolitical sense. But I, I, I want to just, you know, um, piggyback on what you said there as far as uh, U.S. sanctions has increased four times. I mean, the U.S. and the EU just went through their 13th wave of sanctions against Russia which is, you know, unprecedented. And yet, you know, Russia's economy continues to outpace the G7 right now. And obviously they've switched to a wartime economy, but the big loophole is, is that the United States still buys over a billion dollars worth of uranium from Russia because it needs to get that uranium to power the 92 nuclear reactors that actually give about 25% of the electricity needed inside the United States. So you have these massive loopholes and you have, you just realize like, hey, what are we even doing here? This isn't working. And, you know, there's so many interesting geopolitical stories that are evolving around the world. But I really like today's discussion because I think it, it's going to help open a lot of people's eyes up to what's really going on around the world. I want you to end it today, though, talking a little bit more about our live event where you know and I are going to be together along with some other really brilliant minds. Yeah. Give everybody a little bit more um, interest in Nomad Capitalist Live. Interesting enough, um, Malaysia is actually the third most popular segment of followers on this YouTube channel. We've got about 15% wow. of uh, the viewers uh, wow. actually are from, from Malaysia. So very big presence. Um, it's actually, I have a lot of fans that I've kind of teased this out that I'm coming to Malaysia in September. Super excited. I think it's going to be an awesome event. So I think it's really just so happy because I think originally it was going to be in Panama. And then you guys emailed me and said, hey, guess what? It was so successful in KL. We'll bring it back to KL. Yeah. I was like, wow, this is going to be great. So tell us a little bit more about the live event that we're going to have uh, this fall. It's it's our we've done seven of these. This is kind of the fourth of the current iteration, Nomad Capitalist Live. It's a four day event. It is nonstop. I really uh, I have a little bit of a uh, I'm a little self conscious, so I pack it like full to the brim of information. We've got yeah. about forty uh, speakers and panelists from around the world, yourself included. It kicks off Wednesday night with the Majestic Hotel, this beautiful colonial hotel. It's like a hundred and some bucks a night, all included taxes and everything. So it's very affordable for a very historic, uh, really cool hotel, and a lot of amenities. But it's four days of speeches, panels. We're doing more capitalist this year, just as much nomad, a little bit less doom and gloom, more of, okay, where do you go and invest? We have something like half a dozen emerging markets experts. One guy, you know, spends his time investing in Uzbekistan, which Jim Rogers loves. And a lot of people are going to Uzbekistan these days. Like he's the expert on that. We get other right. guys who are big in like Indonesia. We got someone who's an expert in African emerging markets. Some of the stuff may be a little bit too exotic for some people, but you're going to learn what people who are actually doing this stuff are doing. You're going to learn yeah. from people like me of multiple passports. You're going to learn from our team who like we hire all around the world. How do you build a global team? How do you run yeah. a network of offshore companies that work with each other and actually not just set it up, but actually it has to work. It is, right. we've, we've got the scars. So we can open up our playbook and say, here's how we actually run a global company, hire people, get passports. Here's passport programs you haven't heard about. We had to send a guy on the ground. I mean, I one of my passports, I had to go there and knock on like 20 lawyers' doors. I heard you have a law that allows me to do this or that. And finally, someone's like, yeah, I think I heard about that. Yeah. You couldn't <laughs> email them. You had to go there and literally go up and down the street knocking on doors. So That's you hear hilarious. about stuff like wow. that. But yeah. We looked at moving it to, Latin, to back to Latin America. We had it in Mexico for a couple of years. And I think guest count was five or six points higher. But the quality of the people that came to Nomad Capitalist Live in Kuala Lumpur was higher. Overall, I think it was a little bit more profitable. But what I loved was we had people from all around the world. Because in Kuala Lumpur, I mean, if you live in Europe, it's, it's really not much further to Kuala Lumpur. Immigration is easier. Immigration's nicer. We had one guy that went to Mexico. They sent him back. The guy's like a multimillionaire. They kicked him out of the country. Yeah. And okay, that's one guy. I and mean, you don't run your decision, your event based on one guy. But right. I mean, Malaysia, it's like nobody needs a visa. Like the Serbians, the Montenegrins need an e-visa. Like Somalis don't need a visa. Literally, it's like right. everybody can come. Nice. And so, you know, if you're in Europe, it's equidistant. If you're in Asia, it's closer. If you're in Dubai, it's closer. If you're in Australia, it's closer. Like for almost everybody except Americans, Canadians, it's closer. Right. I I want people to come to an event and not only learn from forty speakers who are from all around the world. I think we have like probably just as many nationalities. I mean, from Lithuania to Georgia to Colombia to Venezuela. How do you want to hear about investing in $10,000 apartments in Venezuela? It's safe. Right. It's 10 times safer now than five years ago. Like, where else do you hear this stuff? I don't want it to be just Americans. If you're right. like, 
I'll just go and hang out for giggles and right, complain right. about Biden. Listen, maybe I don't like Biden either, but like, let's focus on the solution. Like, here's how to, you don't like him? You know what? I don't worry about Biden. I don't worry yeah. about Trump. I'm out. Yeah, and exactly. so I just thought to myself, we had the best Americans and the best Canadians ever. And they're the only ones who had to travel further. And again, by the way, for like $200 a night, you get a hotel that's twice as, that's half as good in Panama. It was like right. 270 So it was twice the price. And it wasn't as nice. And I'm like, why right. the hell are we going there? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know? That's awesome. Malaysia. And it, we had the most diverse group of people. And it was and it was beautiful. And like Malaysians were there, Singaporeans. You really meet people from all around the world who are united by a desire to keep more of their money, be free, enjoy their lives. Yeah. That's invaluable. That is invaluable. That's that's fantastic. Well, what a great preview. So certainly, if you're watching this from you know from Asia, you know Singapore, uh, Kuala Lumpur, or really anywhere, like you said, it's very convenient to get to KL. Uh, but I'm certainly excited to be going there in person. I'll be there for a full week in Kuala Lumpur. Uh, we're going to be filming a lot of uh, films, you know, for this YouTube channel, but also obviously attending the show or this uh, event rather, and then also speaking. We can't wait to share those insights with you guys. So, um, Andrew, I want to thank Let me you share so one much. One more thing, if I may. Yeah, yeah, please, please. We charge a bit more for our event because I think the information is very valuable. I mean, again, some of the stuff is literally we had to go and knock on 20 people's doors in some far flung country. We don't sell sponsors. Nobody is hanging their banner or trying to sell you anything. If you want to yeah. hire us for our services, we'll have one or two people there to help you, you know, become a client, but we're not chasing anyone down. There's not really anything for sale at the event. And so rather than selling lower price tickets, then having people trying to hawk you every uh, weird gold scheme or something, uh, right. surely some of the attend some of the other guests may have businesses and they may tell you about you know what they're doing but we don't have sponsors and so i'd rather have the the guests be the customers rather than the right. product that i go out and sell the sponsors and so as a result you pay a little bit more but you get extraordinarily unbiased advice nobody's paying to be on the stage everyone's picked yourself included because i love what they talk about and i don't agree with everybody who's coming but there are people you need to hear from to have the global perspective and i trust people can make up their own minds what works for them yeah Fantastic. Fantastic. Well, I know it's going to be a, ve a very successful event. Last year's event looked incredible. Again, I'm really honored. So thank you for the invitation. And I'm so excited to meet you in person and the entire Nomad Capitalist team and also just connect with so many other people. It's, um, we live in a global economy and I mean, we, we, you know, we need to understand more about the world and there are so many amazing opportunities out there. So Andrew, thank you so much for your time today and uh, really excited. And we're going to put all the details that you need to know about the live event and you know, also Nomad Capitalist. We'll put everything down in the description below. So everyone, as always, thank you for watching it. Could have been anywhere in the world, but you hang out with me and Andrew here today here on YouTube. So thank you for that. We look forward to seeing you all in our next video soon.